Um, so just repeating because we're trying to record this. Um, so the question is, uh, are there different approaches or better approaches for normalizing and scaling given the fact that there are some compounds that are naturally uh, high intensity and other compounds that will have naturally low intensity? Um, so typically, um, even with compounds having naturally high or naturally low in intensities, if that's the way, that's the intrinsic feature of them, essentially how well they fly, um, in the mass spec, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. You could still use the same scaling, same uniform scaling uh, approach. You want to apply it across all of the spectra for all of the samples. So you don't want to do scaling on one side of your spectrum, another side of the spectrum, a different scaling or normalization. It's got to be uniformly applied. It, it just goes back to the point that there, you, you can't you can't quantify um, in untargeted methods. Um, it, it's so if something just naturally is more abundant, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has a higher concentration. It just means that it flies better. Some things that are intrinsically lower again, it just means that it's less ionizable. Um, the only way you can quantify, and the only time you really should be worrying about quantification, is, is actually putting in isotopic standards. Um, people will add uh, extraction references or they will add um, extra compounds to their system just to help with, you know, as a calibration and to help with the scaling. Uh, that's certainly reasonable and feasible to do. Um, you know, some people will add drugs of some types because these are not expected to occur in the sample, so you know what they are, you know that they're unique. Um, but again, it also depends on your extraction protocols and whether it's a hydrophobic or hydrophilic extraction. Um, but yeah, scaling has to be applied across all regions of the spectra and all spectra in the same way uh, to be able to get um, things properly compared. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to go to... Um, metabolite identification and quantification. Um, and we're going to be looking at, at three general approaches um, to compound identification. Uh, we're going to be looking at NMR first, then we're going to do GCMS second, and then we're going to do LCMS. And this is sort of a preamble to the lab that we're going to be doing uh, after lunch. Um, and so this is getting you primed um, so that you, you'll sort of have an idea of what we're doing. And then we'll also talk about um, searching through different databases for, for compound identification, especially with mass spec. So we talked about the last time, which is this idea of being able to go from spectra to lists. And, and formally, this is called metabolite annotation. Um, so your spectrum is unannotated, and when you finish, your spectrum is annotated. And so the annotation could be just saying feature one, feature two, feature three. It could be uh, saying that it's a specific compound, or it could be saying this is a specific compound and this is its intensity or its concentration. Um, all of those are examples of annotation. This is just an example of an NMR uh, spectrum that has been annotated, and then the resulting list of compounds. Now, when metabolomics began about 20 years ago, um, it was lagging behind a lot of other fields. Genomics had already been well developed, um, proteomics was evolving, and what had happened is that genomics and proteomics had online resources, particularly genomics had GenBank, proteomics had um, tools like Mascot um, and um, Blast, same with genomics, Blast, or um, uh, NBLAST X, um, which essentially allowed you to take sequence data or protein data, upload it onto the web, and instantly get your gene identifiers, your abundance of transcripts, your protein identifiers, even concentrations. But um, 
even as recently as 15 years ago, was metabolomics. You'd have your nice GC or LCMS or NMR spectrum, and there was nothing you could upload to. There was no database, there was no BLAST, there was no mascot, no nothing that would give you your metabolite IDs and, and concentrations. And so it's largely over the last 15 years that people have been focusing on trying to develop exactly those tools which can you know, upload your data, press go, and instantly your answer is there. Now it's not yet there, but um, it's on the way and we're going to try and show you some of those examples um, over the next few hours. So in metabolite annotation or metabolite identification, you're, you're dealing with two situations. Um, one we call the known unknowns, and the second one called the unknown unknowns. So the known unknowns are, here's my spectrum, what's in here? Um, if, unless you study spectra, whether it's mass, GC, NMR, you're not going to be able to look at those peaks and instantly identify them. You have to use uh, a technique called spectral deconvolution, where you have reference peaks that allow you to compare. Uh, and the reference peaks are usually pure compounds. And then you're able to align those reference peaks and say, yeah, this must be the compound, or this is another couple of compounds here. Now, that is part of what is typically called targeted metabolomics, um, but it's also part of the metabolite annotation at the end of an untargeted metabolomic study as well. Now, the other situation, which in the case of untargeted metabolomics or LCMS represents 99-98% you know, of the peaks that you're seeing, these are the unknown unknowns. These are the ones that don't match to um, masses or values in HMDB or PubChem or anything. Um, and, and to do these ones, you have to use a completely different technique, uh, which is called computer-aided structure elucidation, or CASE. We're not going to talk about that, um, but it is something that can take months or years to determine the structure of a truly unknown unknown. The words known unknowns and unknown unknowns actually comes from a speech that Donald Rumsfeld gave. So he used to be the Secretary of Defense. And uh, it, was, it became a joke, actually, because of the way he sort of stumbled over his descriptions. But it's still useful to say that you know, there are known unknowns, that is, that we know that there are some things that we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know that we don't know that we don't know. So the unknown unknowns is still a, a fundamental challenge in, in metabolomics. But we're going to talk about the known unknowns. And uh, the spectral deconvolution is a technique that works for NMR, it works for GCMS, and it works for LCMS. So it's a general method. And it, the principle, as I say, is to basically match the peaks to uh, in your mix, mixture of blood or urine or tree sap, whatever, um, to known peaks of pure single compound um, spectra. And so that means you have to have a database, a pre-compiled database of those pure, clean spectra. And this is an example on the right of, of a spectrum that has been deconvolved. The black is representing the actual spectrum. The red is the deconvolution, where you have done your best job to match. And you can see in some cases it didn't match very well, but this is, again, deconvolution. So conceptually, for NMR, but you could also say the same is largely true for mass spec. You have a mixture, which is a top spectrum in, in blue. So you can see about a dozen peaks there. Some are tall, some are short. In NMR, we talk about doublets and triplets and singlets, but you can see you know, a bunch of triplets and a couple of doublets and a couple of singlets. This is a mixture of three compounds. And you can see how it is, because you can see compound A has one spectrum. That's the pure spectrum. Compound B, pure spectrum, is green. And then a purple one, compound C. If you add all three spectra together, you will get the top spectrum. So the challenge in deconvolution is to say, here is my mixture, and it's to go the opposite. What individual compounds will produce this mixture? spectrum. 
that's a little more challenging. It's called a reverse problem, and um, it's potentially multiple solutions. Um, you could argue that all of those doublets could be just a bunch of singlets um, from different other pure compounds that you know are as yet unknown. Um, but as I say, you start with the top, and then you figure out, based on your library, what things best fit. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, in this case, again, it's the sum of the intensities, and it's the location that ultimately tells you whether you've got the correct combination of compounds. It not only identifies, but it also quantifies, saying that each of those are present in exactly one, I don't know, millimolar each. So there are tools around for NMR that do spectral deconvolution. The first one that came out uh, around 1999 or so was called Konomics. It's still produced, and this is an example where it's um, zoomed in, where you can see uh, a bunch of peaks from an NMR spectrum, and in yellow you can see um, one of the spectra from the reference compounds that fits to it. And it also identifies, I can't tell, is that alanine, uh, as being the matching compound there. Um, on the lower right side, you can see the full spectrum of this sample. This is, I believe, a urine spectrum. And then on the left, you can see the picture of the structure, the matching compound, alanine. Um, so it is a bit of drag and drop uh, to try and associate the reference spectrum with the um, observed mixture spectrum. So the NMR suite produced by Keenomics, as I said, has been around for almost 20 years. Um, users will manually process the NMR spectrum, so they have to do a Fourier transform. They do the phasing, and I was showing you examples of how things, they get rid of the water peak, which is very, very strong in NMR, uh, 110 millimolar protons from, from water. Um, you'll do a baseline correction, so everything looks flat. You'll normalize the peak shapes, you'll do the chemical shift referencing. Then once you've got your spectra looking nice, then you have to do uh, essentially a guess and check. This is how most people solve problems, the reverse problem. So you have a library of about three or four hundred spectra, and you will click on different compounds and drag and move those reference spectra to see if they fill in the, the, the peaks that you're observing. So you're superimposing uh, images. And it's the same thing if you've done jigsaw puzzles. You'll take a piece and you'll see it kind of looks like it. You'll move it around. Um, but this one is done on the computer and the mouse. So if people are trained in this, it, it'll take them about 20 to 40 minutes per spectrum. Now, we used to have people run this for this course, but we found that um, even if we had two hours for people to try and do the Kinomics, uh, most people couldn't do it. Um, now, it, it takes more than two hours to train. It can take up to three or four hours to get really good at it. Uh, and so um, that led to us to look to alternatives to try and teach people about how you could do spectral deconvolution. Now, there are uh, commercial programs that um, Brooker produces called Amix. Um, it's again similar to Konomics, it's somewhat manual. They've modified their software so that they can now analyze juice and wine um, pretty automatically. Konomics has also upgraded its software to make it more automatic than it used to be. And then there's some freeware that's also been produced, one called Batman, uh, which is produced by um, Imperial College in, in London, and another one called Basil, uh, which is developed at the University of Alberta, and we're going to be using that later today. So when you have something that is totally automated, as opposed to guess and check, it obviously is faster. Um, so instead of taking up to four hours for people who didn't know what they're doing, or 30 to 40 minutes for people who are pretty skilled, it can be done in a couple minutes. When you have something that's done by a computer, it's also very reliable. Uh, give it the same spectrum, it'll give exactly the same result. Uh, if you gave each of you the same spectrum, we'll get you know, 30 different results. And if we tried you gain on the same spectra tomorrow, you'd also come up with 30 different results, all different from what you did today. Um, 
it also allows you to do something overnight. Uh, people get tired. Uh, we used to do a lot of manual analysis. Uh, Mark has done that manual analysis. Manoj has done manual analysis. They've all aged tremendously um, from doing this. Um, so it, it's tiring. Um, and so if you let a computer run overnight, you can get hundreds of spectra fit. Um, and in some cases, it actually is able to pick out things that people, um, just because of their biases or lack of knowledge, that they cannot easily detect. And so in some cases, the computer does better than humans. This is the Batman homepage. Um, it's probably been updated somewhat. Um, it uses a Bayesian technique to help with spectral peak fitting. Um, there are other tools that have more recently appeared, I think called R Dolphin, I think is one. Um, but um, Batman was one of the early ones, and then another early one was, was Basil. Um, Basil is appealing because it's, it's a web-based tool. Um, so you don't have to download or install anything. Uh, it's quite accurate. Um, it uses uh, what's called probabilistic graphical models or hidden Markov models. Um, if you guys use speech recognition for you know, Google Home or Alexa or Siri, um, those use hidden Markov models to recognize your voice. Um, so they recognize complex patterns, and in many respects, NMR or GC and LCMS spectra look a lot like uh, voice signals. So what it does is it, it fits and shifts uh, peaks, both their intensity and position, the way that a person would do in a guess and check approach, uh, like with the Konomics manual fitting. In order for it to work, uh, just like with Alexa or Siri or Google Home, it has to know that you're speaking English, or in this case, you need to know that you're working with a, a probable biofluid. So to tell it that I am analyzing blood when you're actually analyzing urine, it'll do very, very badly uh, because you've told it the wrong information. So it needs to know what the composition or the biofluid is. But once that's given, uh, then it'll do automatic phasing, automatic chemical shift referencing, automatic rotor removal, and baseline correction, and then it'll do all the automatic identification and quantification. So you can get some pretty complex spectra. Um, here's the top one is an example where there are 90 different compounds in this particular sample. And you can see all the peaks beneath it, the different colors, um, all of them fitting so that you can get this almost perfect match to the observed one. So this is why it would take someone who's untrained many, many hours to try and get all of those peaks fit properly. That's 90, and then you can imagine how much worse it is if you have to deal with 150 compounds. So lots of comparisons are done. It's needed to get it published. Um, but this is an example of one where you do a manual fit at the top. And so this one took this individual about 40, 45 minutes. And then the same spectrum was fit um, with basal. Um, and it took about five minutes with the instrument. And you can see that the, the matches are almost identical, almost all the peaks. So compared the red to the black, um, you can see that, that everything fits quite well. So it's a website. Um, this is what the home page looks like. Um, and users can kind of select which examples they want to use or upload their own data. You'll get a chance to do this later today. Um, so once you start uh, the operation, um, you have to provide some information about um, the instrument frequency, um, the type of um, reference standard you had, um, and how fast you want it to run, fast or slow. The slower one is a little more accurate. Uh, once you've selected those initial parameters, then you can basically press go. Um, so within about the first five seconds, um, the spectrum is um, Fourier transformed. So this is what it initially looks like. Um, at that stage, it looks pretty awful. Um, this is after phasing. So this is correcting, so the peaks have gone from uh, dispersive to absorptive phase. Um, and you can start to see that it looks a little bit more like an NMR spectrum. But again, that's about 15 seconds. 
And about 30 seconds later, it has done the baseline correction, it's removed the water, it's done the chemical shift referencing. So at that stage, it's ready to start the deconvolution. So this is something that normally is done manually by most NMR people, but this system is able to do it automatically. Um, and then deconvolution will take about another three to four minutes. And in the end, the spectrum is produced like this. And if you look closely, you can see there's a black spectrum, but there's also a blue fit to the spectrum. The blue fitting is the deconvolution. Um, and you can zoom in and expand and both the, the X and the Y direction or click on different regions and you can see exactly how things have, have been fit. And to your eyes and to my eyes it looks like it's an, an exact match. Every peak has been matched precisely. And in this spectrum there's actually several hundred peaks, not just the, the really obvious ones. And then below that is a list of the compounds that were identified. Uh, so acetic acid and betaine and carnitine and creatinine and citric acid. So that's on one column and then their concentration is down below. And then on the far right is how confident the fit is. So a 10 means 10 out of 10, it's very confident. Um, lower confidence is around 6 or 7. And those might correspond to a single peak which could or could not be the, the match. Just like trying to use a single mass, paradigm mass is often not sufficient to identify a compound. But in NMR, most compounds have between 3 and 30 peaks. And so in order to match both all the peaks and their chemical shifts and their positions, uh, once you've done that, sometimes you have very, very high confidence. Um, so this is a partial list. This wasn't the full list of the compounds identified. And as I say, everything was done automatically. So to do this, um, you know, it doesn't work for everything. Um, it's for relatively simple biofluids. More complicated ones like urine, it just can't handle. Uh, it's currently limited to um, 500 and 600 megahertz instruments uh, for NMR. It's a measure of the magnetic strength. Um, many people who, who use the online version uh, don't read any of the instructions, and so they'll uh, collect their NMR spectra completely the wrong way, or on completely the wrong fluids, or completely the wrong um, spectrometer strength, and then they'll try and fit, and they'll evidently complain bitterly um, afterwards. Um, so, you know, as with anything in chemistry, um, you know, read the instructions, follow the instructions carefully, collect your spectra, as directed and then things will generally work. The web server can do things in a single spectrum mode. You guys will be using um, uh, one that's designed for batch uploads. Now Mark and Manoj have been actually working on rewriting Basil and a new version of Basil will be coming out later this summer called MAGMET, M-A-G-M-E-T. Uh, it's both faster and more accurate than Basil but since we didn't quite finish in time, we'll be using the basal server this, this time. If you want to come back next year, you can use the magnet one. Now, GCMS is a different beast, um, and the way that it typically is done uh, is to work not with an NMR, but with a mass spec and a gas chromatogram. Typically, you'll have a chromatogram that's up at the upper left. Um, you might choose a peak, and within that peak you might find, in essence, three other peaks. Um, many compounds, if you want, really have the same uh, elution time. And so the only way you can distinguish things that have the same elution or retention time or retention index is to actually collect their spectra. So within that, and this is where we have this retention time versus M over Z um, marking, um, you will see spectra. Um, and so in these cases, the MS spectra will be the electron ionization one, so there'll be lots of peaks, lots of fragments. So this particular small peak had three other compounds in it. Those three compounds had three spectra for it. What you have to do for metabolite identification is then compare those reference spectra to your, which is in your library, to the spectra that you've got from those three peaks. So my reference library here has seven spectra, but I can compare visually, you can too, and see that the top one matches the top one of our 
reference library. The red one matches the one kind of in the middle, which is circled in red, and the green one uh, matches the bottom one, the seventh one in our database. And so if we knew the structures or the names of those compounds, then we've identified them uh, by spectral matching. So this is spectral deconvolution for GCMS, not too much different than what it is for NMR. Now in GCMS or EIMS, where we use electron ionization, we have multiple peaks. Um, so it's not a single peak, it's anywhere from 3 to 10 to 20 peaks that we'll see. This is a better example, a more realistic one, or a more useful one of, of a fragment ion. So if you count the number of peaks here, I count about 15 peaks, I guess. Some small, some big. We can see the parent ion or molecular ion. Um, we can see that it's generally a low resolution technique. It's unit mass. Um, and then we'll see the fragments, or fragment ions. And these are fragments from the parent ion. In some cases we'll see peaks that are even higher than the parent ion, and these may be certain adducts. <coughs> now in many cases, uh, it's important to remember that the GCMS spectra, the compounds, are derivatized. We talked about trimethylsilane, or TMS, and they will be decorated. If there's one TMS, it'll add 72 Daltons. If there are two TMSs, it'll add 144 Daltons, and so on. There are other derivatization agents. TBDMS is one, and it'll add, obviously, more mass to the molecule. And methoxine, or MO, also is a derivatization and it, agent, and it will also add certain masses. So you have to remember that when you're looking at GCMS, most of them are derivatized molecules. The masses do not match the pure compound. They have to match the derivatized compound. Now GCMS works for molecules that have a molecular weight less than about five or 600 Daltons. So that's a, that's a fairly severe limitation. It works really nicely for amino acids and organic acids and some sugars, some fatty acids. But it doesn't work for really hydrophobic molecules or for really heavy molecules. We talked about how its resolution and chromatography, the plate count, um, and reproducibility is, is much better than liquid chromatography. A uh, key advantage of EIMS over LCMS is it's highly standardized. Um, so the EI spectra that were collected on one instrument compared to another instrument, to another, to another, from another generation, they're still very, very similar. And the way, and because of that standardization, it, it is possible to make use of very, very large spectral libraries for GCMS. The largest library is the NIST database, the National Institute for Standards. It's maintained in the U.S. It's, it's commercially available. And they have these things, there's NIST 11, NIST 14, I think NIST 17 or NIST 18 is out. This just represents the year. So NIST 14 was released in 2014. NIST 11 released in 2011. The NIST 14 database uh, has almost 300,000 EI spectra for almost a quarter million compounds. Now it's a little exaggerated because they're counting all of the derivative, derivatized compounds. So many compounds will have three to four derivatives. So the actual number of unique parent compounds is maybe a quarter of what they list there. But it's a lot, so it's a pretty impressive collection. They also have ion trap mass spec and QTOF mass spec. They also have retention index values for about 80,000 compounds. The software looks like this. Has anyone ever used the NIST software? One, two, three, not too many. It's, I think you can tell it looks ancient. Um, it hasn't really been updated a lot, but it, it does, um, does allow you to, to do searches. It has compound uh, identifiers, and then you can compare sort of these mirror spectra between your observed spectrum and the reference spectrum. Uh, the one on red versus the one on blue, which is kind of the thing in the middle on the, on the, in the window here. NIST makes use of a software called AMDIS, which means, stands for Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution, Spectral Deconvolution and Identification System. So just like the NMR concept, it, it'll help identify you know, peaks, distinguish background from noise. Uh, it'll pick out peaks, um, 
which is done similar to basal and also to magnet. And then it'll do the deconvolution, which involves matching spectra to observed spectra and therefore identifying compounds through the library. Now, rather than giving a you know, 0 to 10 confidence score, it produces something called a match factor. Um, so this is a formal definition of the match factor, and so it's measuring the similarity of the mass spectrum of the query to the mass spectrum in the reference database. So you could use a match factor for NMR, you could use a match factor for GCMS, you could use a match factor for LCMS. It's a dot product, so if you I've taken vector uh, algebra or um, matrices, you remember dot and cross products, but it's essentially matching the intensity um, across the, the two peaks and then normalizing it based on the intensity and mass. Match factor is scaled by a factor of a thousand, so the highest possible match factor you can get is a thousand, the lowest obviously is zero. So if you're going to do GCMS spectral deconvolution, there's a few things you have to do. So the first thing you have to do ha is run a set of standards. Um, and they can range from octane to hexadecane. These are alkane standards. And these can serve as your calibration standards, um, not only for intensity, but also for retention. Um, so that's your external st standard, the calibration standard, to help with quantitation and retention. Then you run a blank sample. Uh, anyone who's ever worked with mass spec knows that you can inject essentially nothing and end up with lots of peaks. Um, so this blank sample allows you to sort out what those not, uh, strange peaks are often solvent or derivatization agents. And then you run the sample of interest um, under the same conditions, solution, um, heat gradient, temperature gradient uh, as the blank. So here are your external standards which you run. They should be well separated. Uh, and if you know their concentrations, then you can match their, con their intensities to help calibrate the concentration. Um, that calibration file, is C-A-L, um, um, will be used to calculate your retention indices, uh, but also to help calibrate the intensities. And then once you have those retention indices from your alkane standards, then it helps narrow down your search with AMDIS. So AMDIS will search through the NIST database, the two are coupled, um, and match and display the, those best matches. Um, It'll also, through that matching, some of it automatic, some of it manual, allow you to get rid of the, the false positives that are in the blank. So here is the AMDIS tool that's allowing you to create this calibration file. We're not going to run AMDIS, I'm just showing some screenshots. And you can see the alkane standards as they're marked in there. It then reads them in and calculates your retention indices for the actual spectrum. So you're calibrating uh, with that alkane standard. The alkane standard then readjusts uh, your spectrum, which, as you can see, in the, sort of the white has a whole bunch of small and large peaks all scattered all through it. And so now the retention indices are, are properly calibrated. Once you've got things calibrated, um, then you can do this thing where you're going to look at individual peaks on the chromatogram. Now remember, a peak is not necessarily a pure compound. Um, it is going to be a retention time and then a bunch of m over z values. And so this particular one, uh, we've chosen this peak, we've clicked on it, and then we can see a white, a red, a blue, a yellow uh, set of peaks that are all in there. Um, we'll zoom in a little more so you can see it. So I've clicked on the peak here, and I can see a yellow, red, blue, white. Um, the white is the overall sum, and the blue, red, yellow are the uh, individual peaks. Um, clicking on those peaks, one has a mass of 73 Daltons, another has a mass of 144. Turns out they are both on the same spectrum, um, roughly the same intensity. 
and then I can compare it, or AMDIS will compare it to its library, and it finds it's almost an exact match, an 84% or 840 um, match factor to valine. So that peak marked in red there, at the red box, um, based on its match factor and the comparison to the uh, deconvolved spectrum of pure valine, which you can see at the bottom there, matches pretty well. Um, and so you can, with high confidence, say that that peak is valine and nothing else. There might be some element, the yellow one may not be valine, it might be some other small, low abundance molecule, and you may have to do a bit more deconvolution. So it's an interactive process. Um, you're working with visual cues, you're clicking on things, um, you're assessing, you're evaluating the match factor. Um, so it takes time, uh, and different people will get different results, just like with Konomics as a manual approach. So there are uh, some, and you guys will try this today, called automatic approaches, the GC auto fit. I'll talk about that later. There are also other manual approaches produced by other companies, Analyzer Pro, Chromatoff, uh, and Amdis. And these were compared about 10 years ago. Things haven't changed a whole lot. There are obviously other alternatives to the NIST database, NIST 08, NIST 11, NIST 14, and NIST, I think, 17 or 18 now. Um, there's a GOLM database, um, and Oliver Fiend's group has developed a database called the Finglib database. So those are commercial. A GC Autofit is one that we developed again for this course uh, and also for our own work. So the intention was to make this um, freely available and over the web. So it's a web-based tool. Uh, hasn't been published yet, um, but um, it's been kicking around for a couple of years. Um, it follows the same protocol. You need a three spectra. One is of the sample, one is of a blank, and one is of the alkane standards or calibration standards. Uh, it does uh, auto alignment, that's the calibration. It does peak identification, just like AMDIS. It does peak integration, just like AMDIS. But also does concentration and compound identification. It'll take a bunch of different files, uh, NetCDF or MZ XML, and I think we'll have to adapt it to MZML. It's faster than the NMR, and uh, it can actually do uh, more compounds. Uh, it's able to analyze urine. Uh, and saliva. It works okay for blood, uh, but it's particularly good for urine. Like uh, an NMR method, you have to follow a protocol. So if you don't follow the protocol, it won't fit. If you give it the wrong um, biofluid and say it's urine when in fact it's blood, it'll also do a poor job. So you have to, uh, as with anything, uh, follow the rules. Um, these are some files that are intended to help you with running the, the software uh, when you do the lab later to today. Um, the alkane standards um, are marked uh, with special names. The blank samples are marked with obvious names. Sample files are what you will be provided with. Uh, if you have to convert, you can convert uh, NetCDF. Um, um, to XML, and there's various tools like ChemStation and Proteo Wizard that are freely available. So it's pretty simple to do. Um, you have three files to upload, so you browse them, the alkane standard, the blank, and the samples. You guys will have those files that you can download, and you'll be able to do this. Um, you can also, uh, if these are all zipped into a single file, you can upload the single zipped file, um, and that'll save time as well. Um, generally, uh, people running GCMS will have their, their library. There's preferred libraries for different types of biofluids, some for serum, some for urine, some for saliva. Um, in this case, we're running urine. We're choosing a particular urine library. Um, and we're telling the, the type of biofluid that it is, uh, and whether there's a specific calibration. Um, this is the calibration process, so it's taking the alkane standards, uh, adjusting the retention time, so everything is all uh, scaled and, 
and properly um, um, aligned. And the blank spectrum is then added so you can get rid of noise or junk peaks. Those are also removed. And so now you reduce your initial, initial spectrum, which had kind of odd retention times and noisy peaks, to something that is interpretable. And at that stage, the deconvolution starts. So it uses essentially the same viewing tool that is used in Basil. Uh, you see a little spectrum in the upper left corner, which is the full spectrum. And then you'll see peaks, which you can click on to identify uh, which compound is which. Uh, there's a comma-separated value file, which indicates the uh, compound name, its retention time, the intensity, and the calculated concentration. Um, so as I say, it's even the table view, which is what most people are interested in, the concentrations, or the spectrum view, which just sort of gives you some reassurance that, that the fitting has worked. Sometimes it may completely go sideways, but that's quite rare. Uh, and as I say, the table values allow you to uh, read off your concentration. So just like Basil, um, you can just upload spectra, press go, wait a few minutes, and you've got your compounds identified and their concentrations rolling out. Now, at this point, it's probably useful to remind people about um, the levels of identification that are used in both metabolomics, in particular as it relates to mass spectrometry. So the Metabolomic Standards Initiative from about 10 years ago identified four levels of metabolite identification. Highest level are the positively identified compounds. So those have to be confirmed and matched to a known standard. So it means physically having this known standard in your freezers and running it. Most of us never do that. So Putatively identified compounds correspond to what you're matching the mass and retention time. So that's the AMDIS thing. That's the GC autofit thing. And it's matching not just the mass spec, but also retention time, or the tandem mass spec, or the EIMS and retention time. Um, third category is compounds that are putatively identified by a compound class. This is where most people actually are. So they identify compounds just using a parent ion mass. So I've measured something at 172.1638. I look it up on PubChem, and I find the first thing that hits uh, my eyes, and I say, that's my compound. Uh, that's how most people still do metabolomics, unfortunately. Um, other people may only be able to say, I can't really say what it is. I can just give you the mass, and therefore I can calculate the molecular formula. So that's also considered a putative identification, so level three. And level four, the totally unknown compounds, which in case of LCMS account for about 98% of the peaks. So again, to reiterate, most of us, the best we can do is sort of this level two. Uh, many people still, unfortunately, are doing level three. Uh, almost no one is able to achieve level one. On the other hand, NMR inherently is level one because inherently you're me matching uh, dozens of peaks, not only their positions, but also their intensities. And so it can't be anything else. Um, so NMR inherently gives you a higher level of metabolite identification. Any questions about that? All right. Now, LCMS. Uh, you'll notice the figure looks almost identical to the figure for GCMS, and in many respects it is. Um, we work with liquid chromatographic um, outputs. Most peaks uh, from an LC run will have multiple compounds buried under them, and we can either collect the ESIMS or MSMS spectra for those, and the combination of the ESIMS or MSMS spectra then can be matched against the library. Uh, and that's how we ultimately identify the compounds. There's a lot of tools that are around to facilitate that. Um, commercial ones from Agilent, Brooker, Thermo, Waters, Cyx, all of these produce commercial tools. And then there's a variety of free options, um, XCMS, MZMine, um, several others. 
um, all of which can help with uh, compound identification. We're going to focus on XCMS and specifically XCMS Online, partly because it's free. Um, it's also one of the original ones for uh, spectral processing. It does this, the deconvolution, um, similar to AMDIS, similar to Basil, similar to GC out of it. It does peak picking, peak matching, but it also does an extra thing, which is retention time alignment. And that was one of the things I mentioned last time about how you've got all this collection of many spectra and you have to try and match their fact that sometimes the column is fast, sometimes it's slow. You can get XCMS as a program or you can access it through the web. It accepts lots of different data formats and it's linked to a database called Metlin, which allows you to identify uh, two reference spectra um, and match the compounds. So this is the general workflow um, for XCMS. So it's an untargeted technique. The idea is to upload lots of LCMS data, 10, 20, 100, or 1,000 spectra. Um, you get the extracted ion chromatograms. So from there, you will then perform a alignment. This is this non-linear alignment method. Once those are aligned, um, then you can perform some of the peak picking, and then the mass measurements, spectral matching, as well as uh, parent ion masses, are ultimately used to identify those compounds. Peak identification in LCMS is difficult. It's much harder in LCMS than it is in GCMS and in NMR. And there are a variety of tools that have been developed. Um, XCMS doesn't have the best peak picker. There are others that seem to be, do better. Um, but this is an example of how the peak picking is done. Um, peak alignment and retention time correction. Uh, this is an example where you can see where everything's slightly off uh, in the top one. And then after uh, alignment, everything is nicely matched. So these alignments, uh, obviously there's also scaling that can be done or should be done. Um, all are critical as are the peak identification and distinguishing peaks from noise. This was published uh, about 10 years ago and the time XCMS was doing extremely well. As I said, there are other tools now that seem to outperform XCMS. Um, and some of the other ones that were uh, also later modified. So it's a, it's a busy field in the sense of the number of tools and the performance of the different algorithms. But as I tell you, we're just going to focus on XCMS today because most of the other ones are not available over the web. Most are either commercial and others require lots and lots of challenges of installing. How many people have used XCMS? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many people used XCMS online? Two or three, four or five, okay. Um, so that's what we're going to use today. Um, this requires uh, a user account. And I don't know if people actually have or if we told them to make user accounts. We did not. We did not. Okay, lunch break. Instead of eating lunch, you're going to be making user accounts. Um, and you're going to register. Um, Potentially, you could do this now if you want. Um, so once you create a user account, then there's some, several steps. And again, we're going to go through this in a bit more detail. Uh, this is just a, a preamble so that you're not too shocked when you actually have to do this. Um, you're going to be choosing the different jobs. There are four types of jobs, single, pairwise, multigroup, and meta XCMS. And then you're going to define your upload um, and define certain parameters, and then you're going to submit your job. Again, we're just sort of stepping through this fairly quickly. So uh, once you've chosen your job, um, then you're uploading your data. There are more slides we'll show you to sort of walk you through this. Um, but again, it's, it's fairly standard with web tools. Click, press, click, press, and uh, as long as you know where your files are, it's relatively painless. Once you've uh, uploaded the data, then you can submit the job. Um, and it's, again, step one, step two, step three. 
Once that's done, you're going to have to wait for a notification. Um, it can be 10, 15, 20 minutes for some of the things to be processed. Uh, we will probably hit this pretty hard. So it could take a while for some results to happen. Um, what we will do is we're going to break you guys up into different groups so that we just don't demolish the system. So there's actually three sets of two tables each. So the first set of tables will be for NMR, another one will be assigned to GCMS, another one will be assigned to XCMS. Then you guys will flip and switch. So once you've received your email notification from your account, um, you can view results uh, and, and, and download them as, as needed. Um, there's graphical summaries, which are quite impressive. There's also um, tables, um, uh, comma-separated or Excel-like tables, which have very similar types of information that you would have seen with the uh, GC AutoFit. So, uh, identifiers, not necessarily names of the compound, but uh, information on retention times, average intensity, individual peak intensities, their, their mass, paradigm mass, and so on. Now, as I've highlighted before, when you're looking at, at LCMS data, there's lots of peaks, tens of thousands of peaks. A lot of them are not necessarily real. Um, the peak intensities that are recorded are only relative, so with XCMS you do not get concentration data, unlike with, say, GC AutoFit or unlike with Basil or Konomics. Um, peaks aren't identified with compound names, so in order to annotate the compounds, then you have to go to separate tools, say Metlin or HMDB, to use either the MS or tandem mass data. Now we've talked about how NMR is good for hydrophilic compounds and how GCMS is good for um, acids and in some cases amino acids. LCMS is best for uh, lipids, uh, for fatty acids, and for generally hydrophobic molecules. You can get amino acids, you can get some hydrophilic ones, but not as many. To really do proper identification with LCMS-based metabolomics, you need both the MS, which is the parent ion, and the tandem MS data, along with retention data. Ideally, you'd also like to have some internal standards to validate that. If you have very, very high accuracy or BTRAP FTMS data, um, it can help narrow down what your compounds are, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what they are unless you've either got the authentic one or a lot of MS, MS, or MS to the end spectra. Uh, from reference libraries. So as I said, uh, for many years, and unfortunately still today, a lot of people identify compounds purely by mass matching. So I found the thing at 172.1634, they'll upload it into Kebby, they'll upload it into PubChem, they'll upload it into ChemSpider, or they'll upload the mass in HMDB, and simply say, do I get a hit? And you could do this at the PubChem, which has, you know, a hundred and some million compounds. And here we are uploading a particular mass uh, or mass range. I've got anything between 89 and 89.1 Daltons is what I've put in. And what do I find? This particular list gives me 400 and some matches. Um, so I could choose the first one, or the fourth one, or the 24th one, and say that's my match, but that's, that's not good science. I could use Kebby and say, okay, this is more biological stuff. 99% uh, of the compounds in uh, PubChem are actually not in living systems, uh, whereas with Kebby, these are biologically related. Uh, so Kebby also has a mass search, and you can give it a specific range as does HMDB, as does ChemSpider. But what is fundamentally important to remember is that if you're doing biology, look through biological databases. If you know where the organism you're studying, look at the database specific to that organism. Trying to do a search and a hit to a match through PubChem is about 99% guaranteed to give you a false positive. Now there are more advanced searches where you can now search not just with simply a mass or a mass range, but you can actually do spectral matches um, or 
um, associate things for um, adducts and adduct variants. Uh, we'll go through some of them, but we've mentioned NIST, which has lots of databases for QTOF, um, and IONTRAP, METLIN has a variety of spectra uh, for QTOF and IONTRAP mass bank. And then we'll talk about another tool called CFMID. So it's not just simply mass searches, but parent ion, peak list searches, as well as spectral matching. Um, so this is more proper, more correct, although there are caveats. I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool that was developed recently called CFMID. Has anyone heard of this? Okay, no one except Karen. <laughs> so this is a server that allows you to do compound identification from tandem mass spectra, or MSMS data. Uh, it also predicts MSMS spectra from known compounds, and it uses machine learning techniques. It's been adopted also to GCMS data as well. So currently it's the only tool out there that allows you to take a compound, draw it, and predict the EIMS or MSMS spectra. It also has a large library of predicted spectra, uh, as well as known spectra, so people can then upload a spectrum and say, what does it match? It can also annotate spectra with the individual fragment ions and tell you what those fragment ions are. So it has three options. Um, Spectral prediction, peak assignment, or compound identification. So the compound identification option is you upload your MSMS spectrum of your compound of interest, um, pick and select things uh, as you normally do, indicate the collision energy. Uh, if you have multiple collision energies at which you collected spectra, that's usually a little more informative. And then it'll have its predicted spectrum. This is a little older view, but it now has, I guess, the mirror view with the observed spectrum on top and the predicted spectrum on bottom. And then it gives you the listed compounds and their match factor uh, based on that. Yes? Yes, you're allowed. Um, does, it, does it predict like classes for fragments that might necessarily belong to a specific molecule, but like a class of molecules? Uh, it's, it's specific to uh, individual molecules rather than sort of classes, but you will find common fragments from many things, that, you know, see benzyl rings or uh, it sort of predicts, I guess, McClafferty rearrangements and things like that. So um, it's, it's used a lot by people now to do unknown identifications. Um, and in fact, it's been used extensively in the HMDB to predict spectra for all of the compounds in HMDB. Um, and then most uh, mass spec companies are using the code now to generate MSMS spectra predictions using their different instruments, so from Orbitrap to IonTrap to FTICR, depending on the collision energies they use. So if you had an It can, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not perfect. Um, I mean, no one yet has got something that predicts perfectly, but um, it's very accurate um, for some compounds. There's a new version coming out, which is very, very accurate for lipids. Um, and uh, it usually gives you a hint of what's, what's going on. Natural product chemists have used it a fair bit to do compound ID. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, David, I have a question. Hey, Francis, hi. <laughs> um, some of these compounds, are, I saw some reference to a keg and so forth. Do, do they know, is there like taxonomic origin? Like microbiome versus, let's say you're looking at a human sample, do you know if it's from microbiome versus, versus the human genome to the pathway? Yeah, so, um, there are organism-specific databases, and then within the human metabolome database, they also indicate um, where it's from, yeah. And in some cases, an example, alanine can be both endogenous 
but it's also produced by microbes. Uh, and you can't know how much or what portion is. But there's others that are exclusively produced by microbes. Um, uh, so hippuric acid is exclusively produced by microbes, um, although it comes from polyphenols that you eat from your food. So it's sort of a, a mix of both a, a food and a, a microbial metabolite. So that information is encoded in, in a number of ones. Um, the Human Metabolome Database has also been updated recently with a, an ontology, a chemical ontology similar to gene ontology. And it's providing uh, information about the provenance, health applications, um, industrial or functional roles. Um, so all the compounds are being annotated with, with that chemical ontology now. Um, but yeah, the origins and pathways is still sometimes challenging because, in fact, sometimes compounds are, you know, pools for, pooled from many ones. Anyways, for those of you who haven't met Francis, this is Francis Willette. Um, he's one of the founders of the CBW and, and in charge of the CBW program. Actually, David and I are the only two remaining founders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the others died from old age. <laughs> um, no, that's true. I guess we've been around for a long time. And that was the, the sign there is, we think, is 20 years old and starting to show its... <laughs> um, anyways, I'll carry on because I guess we, we probably have some hungry souls here. Um, so, um, so when we're doing metabolic compound identification by mass spec only, um, we can and we'll see things like salt adducts and neutral law species and multiply charged species. These are extra peaks that show up in the mass spectrum. And these extra peaks are uh, a lot of what we see. In some cases we mistakenly think they are real features. Um, technically they are noise. We often have to do a lot of work to try and distinguish those adducts and multiply charged species from the parent ions or to merge them into single peaks. So what is an adduct? And this is an example of uh, a spectrum of a compound um, or several compounds where you're seeing sodium being attached. So this particular lipid, I think, uh, has a molecular weight of a uh, parent ion of 951 daltons. Uh, add sodium to it and you increase its molecular weight by about 22 daltons. Um, so we replace the hydrogen with a 23 of the sodium, so 23 minus 1 is 22. And you can see these structures. These will fly very nicely in a mass spectrum. So it's easy to mistake a sodium addict or a potassium addict or a calcium addict for the parent ion. Um, that makes it a little more confounding. In many cases, you'll see multiple addicts. And so again, you might think these are all different compounds. Um, so there's a variety of software tools that help sort this out, but it's not trivial. Um, this deconvolution process is to, typically to try and take or convert all of these adducts into uh, a single um, parent ion and, and to make that um, much more simple. So in terms of common adducts, um, we can see a long list, a variety of ones that are provided. Some represent cations, some represent anions. Some represent combinations of additions and subtractions. There are tables. Oliver Fien has produced a very popular table showing another long list of adducts and how much uh, a mass will be added or subtracted uh, in some cases. Uh, there are also a variety of neutral loss fragments that will occur. Um, so these are essentially uh, the removal of, of um, moieties in the molecule, um, leaving a, in some cases just a neutral compound which is not detectable, uh, along with the fragment which is ionized and detectable. So these issues are not handled simply by pure mass searches. They have to be handled by specialized databases and there's a variety of those that are available. Uh, Metlin, HMDB, MZDB uh, are able to handle addicts. Some are able to predict ion pairs and multiply charged species. Some can also predict neutral loss species. When you're working with LCMS data, particularly with the more sophisticated software, which you guys will deal with with 
XCMS or with uh, MZ Mine or other things, um, you will try and consolidate those addicts and you'll try and consolidate those multiply charged species. Uh, you'll try and consolidate some of the fragments, the neutral loss fragments, um, some of the in source fragments, break down products and rearrangements. You'll also then try and consolidate the isotope peaks, all of those cascading smaller peaks, into a single peak. Um, you'll also try and remove the blank or the noise peaks, which we all know show up in all mass spec ones. And this can be done through things like comparing between technical replicates or doing a deletion series to see uh, which peaks appear and disappear. So typically, if you start off with a spectacular looking LCMS chromatogram, which gives you, you know, 15,000 features in the positive mode and 10,000 features in the negative mode, when you start doing these cleanups, if you start removing and consolidating addicts, you go from 15,000 to 12,000. Consolidate the multiple charges, you go from 15,000 down to 10,000. Remove the neutral losses and the isotope peaks, you go from 15,000 down to 3,000. Remove the noise, you go from 15,000 down to 2,500. So the net result is you've reduced things by about a factor of six in terms of these are real peaks. Um, and typically negative ion mode less sensitive, um, so usually not as many. So you can go from 25,000 to 27,000 features down to about 4,000 peaks that are confidently confirmed. But you still see people publishing and saying, yeah, I have 27,000 peaks. Um, and when you see numbers like that, you immediately know they haven't done proper cleanup. So once uh, you have done some of the cleanup, then you can start trying to identify what those compounds are. And as I say, we can still use very, very high resolution mass spec to not necessarily identify the compound, but to identify a class or at least a molecular formula. So there are tools that are called molecular formula generators, which will take a high accuracy, you know, three, four decimal plates mass value, uh, and allow you to generate a formula. Uh, so MZDB is an example. There are other ones that are out there that use the golden rules with all the graphene, the commercial packages as well. And you can restrict things to say, well, I know that my compounds don't have fluorine in them, that they don't have um, boron. So I can narrow it down to carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe sulfur. And so with that information, it'll reduce um, the search space and also narrow down what the molecular formula or formulas are. And then you can go and search against databases, not purely by mass, but by molecular formula. And that gives you, I guess, potentially a slightly better search uh, option, but still not great. So I'm just simply saying it's possible, but I strongly discourage it. Now you can go further, where it's not just simply saying it's just got to be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. If you make use of other bonding restrictions, the atomic composition, but also the isotopic abundance, you can do even better. And this is something that grew out of work from Oliver Fien and the so-called seven golden rules, which have been around for a while. But these allow, again, using information in the spectrum, as well as at high accuracy masses, as well as information about what's allowed in chemistry. You know, you can't have a C1201 compound. Um, it just can't physically bond. Um, so those rules allow you to narrow down what is a reasonable formula um, and what's a feasible structure. So these formula filters are available also in commercial packages. Brooker can also provide that sort of formula filter, Thermo, I'm sure, and others. So this is uh, sort of a scale of what's possible um, in terms of if you limit things to all compounds less than 2,000 Daltons with carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus. So that's 8 billion elemental compositions. If you use the seven golden rules, that shrinks it down by a factor of um, 12 or 13. Um, 
And then if you look at uh, isomers and the formulas in PubChem, that shrinks it down to 700,000. And then if you shrink that further in terms of the number of ones that are known, uh, it's even smaller. As you increase the molecular weight, the number of possible compounds increases. Um, so if you're looking at large molecules, it's technically more difficult to identify them purely by formula or by mass matching. If you're looking at small molecules, it is intrinsically supposed to be easier. There's also some data indicating how mass accuracy does improve um, the performance for identifying or zeroing in on what the compounds are. So either you have an incredibly accurate mass spectrometer at 1 or 0.1 ppm, or if you use the isotopic abundance, then you can also shrink things down quite considerably. If you have a low resolution mass spectrometer, um, you can see how the number of possible matches increases quite significantly. You can also see on this table that as the molecular weight increases, the possibilities also vastly increase. Now, these are all essentially trying to highlight the fact that it is dangerous, extremely dangerous, to identify compounds on the basis of mass. A, you can see the number of possible matches, the number of possible molecules, um, and that even if you are still trying to use mass plus isotope abundance, you still have lots of possibilities, and you still haven't met the criteria from the MSI standards of going much beyond a level 3, uh, not even close to level 2. Um, this is an example of a compound that was actually uh, identified ultimately by using isotopic abundance, uh, parent ion mass, but also lots of NMR and lots of MSMS. Um, but um, again, where you see high resolution mass spec, you can see the isotopic abundance, it narrows down what the formula can and should be, and then by uh, matching to what the known compounds for this particular plant could and should be, um, they were able to get a pretty good idea of what it was, which ultimately was con confirmed. Anyway, so this is an identification of a known unknown from a tomato um, and looking at uh, the actual mass matches. Now, as I said, um, if you use databases improperly, you're going to end up with lots of mistakes. Uh, many databases, especially PubChem, also Metlin, also NIST, mix non-metabolites with metabolites. Others will mix plant metabolites with animal metabolites or drugs with buffers. Um, so if you're, you know, looking at a pure system, um, I don't know, looking at pine needles, you should not see, um, you know, antidepressant drugs in it. Pines do not take drugs. Um, but if people are not smart, they will simply look for the best mass match, and then they'll simply say, well, this is the first hit I found. Um, there's lots of examples where people have found truly ridiculous uh, matches for uh, especially mouse and rodent studies, again, showing that they're all on antidepressants or something like that. Um, the other thing that people seem to forget or neglect is that if you know your organism, there are plenty of databases that are now organism specific. So the human metabolome database is specific to humans. If you're analyzing drugs, you might as well look at a drug database. If you're looking at the E. coli metabolome, look at the E. coli metabolome database. If you're looking at yeast, look at the yeast metabolome database. If you're looking at Arabidopsis, look at the Arabidopsis database or the Knapsack database. If you're studying foods and food products, look at FoodDB. Um, there's no point and no reason to start searching, say, PubChem when you know precisely what your organism or system is. Now, as I'd mentioned before, non-targeted mass spec or untargeted mass spec is not able to do quantification. Um, so the vast majority, 90% of published MS studies are not quantified or quantifiable. Um, in order to do quantification, you have to spend money. You actually have to buy the isotope state <coughs> labeled standards or spike them. In many cases, people even have to synthesize them. 
those isotope standards have to be identical or similar to the ones that are in or being measured. Uh, you use a technique called single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring, SRM or MRM, to ensure not only the compounds are identified, but also to ensure good quantification. So this is standardly used in clinical triple quad mass spectrometry or clinical ion trap mass spectrometry. And this is an example of a compound where it's deuterated and non-deuterated, and so those two are added, or the deuterated version is included. And the um, multiple reaction monitoring allows you to look specifically for the fragment or characteristic fragments of that molecule, and those are known, uh, and they are ensured to be unique. Um, they don't overlap with anything, or sometimes it's a combination of fragments to be certain that it, this is the only molecule that can be there. And then it's quantified by looking at the isotopically labeled fragments um, to ensure that you can quantify. So there are a couple of quantification kits uh, that allow you to do quantitative mass spectrometry by mass spec. Um, a company called Biocrates has produced the P150, the P180, and the P400 kits. Um, P180 is quite popular. Has anyone ever used a Biocrates kit for mass spec? No one? Anyways, these are uh, a great way for people to do quantitative mass spec and are quite popular in um, core labs in the US, Canada, Europe, and Japan. They're not heavily used by um, smaller independent labs, which is a shame because uh, these are intended to make uh, metabolomics very simple. Um, so um, these are some examples. Typically with mass spec, uh, you can go down to 10 nanomolar levels and high concentrations of up to about 10 millimolar. Um, so the lowest limit is about a thousand times better than what you can do by NMR. And the highest limit is about 10 times worse than what you can do by NMR. Anyways, it's still very impressive, still very reproducible, and um, a very simple way to get quantitative mass spec data. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, but again, if you want to start getting ready for lab number two, um, there are some data files that you can start downloading from the website or the wiki. Uh, you guys also have to try and get an account for uh, XCMS online. Uh, so I think if you want to try and do that, the downloading may take a little while because I think we've got a slow connection and perhaps Anne might have some comments or cautions for us.